Radio. Okay, so yeah, my name's Sid Coates. Um, my talk is pretty much the antithesis of what they just talked about. Well, it's actually on the same wavelength. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a different scenario. Uh, this talk is suitable for anyone who eats or uses products derived from agriculture. So I assume that's everyone in the room. Everyone. And yeah, I want to make sure that this talk is not, not much of a lecture. Like, I don't want to be lecturing to you or, you know, I want to be on your level. Like, I want it to feel like it's something that you guys can do. Um, and the barrier to entry is not as high as it sounds. Uh, hopefully it's not too technical. And I'll just start by saying I'm not a farmer and I'm not an expert. In fact, I've never actually been inside of a John Deere tractor, although I know quite a bit about them. I'm a good faith hacker. <laughs> and I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. So the, the oh, we'll get into that later. So that's all my socials. If you want to follow me, um, just Google sick codes. The DEF CON video that I did, uh, which was pretty, pretty popular at DEF CON, you may have seen the news about it. Um, you can just look that up on YouTube. It's on the DEF CON channel. And yeah, if you need a pen test, ring in. Give me a buzz. Um, yeah, just some of the stuff I found vulnerabilities in, stuff like Facebook, Messenger, uh, you know, Signal, Tor, et cetera, et cetera, and John Deere. A <laughs> bunch of CVEs that I achieved, or sorry, not achieved, acquired, I guess that's probably a better word, because, you know, they're, they're community-driven of things. Um, quick disclaimer, which I won't read, but, um, yeah. Yeah, everything today is all sweet. And some things to keep in mind is uh, coming to terms with risk in agriculture. Now, you'll, you'll get a hint of where there's sort of a sliding scale of things that can go wrong in ag during the talk. Um, and just remember that food and agriculture are in fact part of ICS, so industrial control systems. <coughs> just, despite there not being a current ISAC, and I believe that's, someone can quote me, but something to do with... Um, um, yeah, the medical devices industry has one, but agriculture doesn't, which, um, yeah, should be changed. Uh, and why right to repair is separate, completely separate from security in some or most aspects, aspects. Yeah, basic outline, we're going to talk about some current issues, then hacking, hardware, and I've actually got some hardware here too. This is a special, special John Deere hardware, um, and then jailbreaking uh, that. <laughs> so we're starting with this. So yeah, ag is actually the first step of the supply chain. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people understand or you know, can grasp that you know, ethanol, biofuels, wheat, you know, feed. What's, is that? That's not feedback, is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's got it. <laughs> yeah, so America's, this is the JBS, pardon me. This was the colonial pipeline hack. This is, you know, middle of last year, whole pipeline's gone down. Gas stations running dry. This is real, by the way. Um, and then the JBS, uh, another supplier there, paid $11 million ransom. So we know that they're paying ransoms. Uh, Russian hackers hacked an Iowa grain corp, so close to home. $5.9 million ransom. Agco was also disrupted, and they did too, in fact, pay the bounty, which I believe was in the tens of millions. Someone can quote me on that. Uh, and that was a story about something that I did. Uh, this is a new jailbreak for John Deere tractors, and this is a John Deere <coughs> jailbreak and tractor right here. Uh, sorry, tractor display. But it's the display that goes in every single tractor. So, And that's another story of the same thing, and the same thing. And, oh, that's it there. Yeah. I'll show you a video of it now, if that's all right. I might have just spoiled a little bit of it, but... Um, this went quite viral. Uh, Oh, there's audio, I can turn it down. There's like party music in the background, but um, yeah. I oh, know, don't worry if you can't see or read it. It's literally just me tapping away at the terminal. And it's actually the same thing that's here. You can come up and play it after as well, or play with it, because you'll see in a minute what's actually on that. <coughs> so it's Doom. Yeah, that's Doom 2 on a John Deere tractor, which obviously doesn't come out of the factory like that, so. 
and it's also a tractor edition Doom. It was a heavily modified uh, version of Doom, and they're a feral, feral pigs. I think you call them, what are they called? Uh, boars, aren't they? But yeah, you can pick up the, the, the wheat or some nondescript yellow crop, uh, and that gives you, a, I think it's an armor bonus? Oh, it's a health bonus. And I think when you get corn, it gives you an armor bonus. Yeah, the armor's going up, so. And that's a real John Deere display flagship. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they weren't too excited to see that the first time. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, so if you Google John Deere jailbreak, you'll see it's like there's like hundreds of articles about this. Yeah, it was quite, quite fun. So, yeah. And it took a really long time to do. I think the Doom mod was actually one of the lo longest parts, but, uh, but actually, yeah, it took about a couple of months, actually upwards of about a year. So he's about to pass off there. So, But yeah, that was pretty sophisticated. Uh, and that was the, that's the video on YouTube. You can go find that. It's on the DEF CON Net channel. And what did jailbreaking that John Deere display show? And in my perspective, you know, the three things that you can talk about in vulnerabilities, you know, confidentiality, integrity, availability, you know, did that affect availability? Well, not really because, you know, the services are still running. There's, you know, it's, it's DIY. It's like rooting your own Android. You're going to destroy your own thing, you know, and I did destroy it multiple times. Integrity, I would probably, let's have a look at confidentiality first. So low to none. So <clears throat> the risks involved with the confidentiality of that unit is low to none because you're self-jailbreaking it. So it's up to the person to do it. But, you know, that could be construed as high to medium, depending which way you look at it. And then integrity, medium to high, because, like, the fact that I can do that is kind of concerning. You know, the, I'm playing Doom on a flagship agriculture display. And as I talked about before, agriculture is one of the key industries, and John Deere is a key company in agriculture, if not the most key. Was there a word? Keyest? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so a couple of little timelines. I'll, I won't read all of it, but yeah, Colonial Pipeline, May last year. You know, end of May the last year, JBS. And JBS is a little bit awkward, actually, because there's a little bit of shroud around what actually happened there, and I won't talk about it, but it's kind of, uh, maybe it'll come out. There's a few articles about JBS and some oddities at the company. Um, Anyway, yeah, so Agco as well. So they had their trade secret stolen. The whole company was ransomware. Um, all the data was stolen. Well, significant amount of data. They paid the ransom. Uh, and yeah, in-depth, lengthy remediation recovery. So just on that, manufacturers or OEMs, they need to get lucky every single day of the week. Every time they go out there and put a device into market, they need to get lucky every time. But hackers only need to get lucky once. You know, if they get in once, it's that thing about the cops, you know, the, every time you can drive around without a license, cops pull you over, you know, the first time you're going to get done, but you can drive around all day. Um, and then we'll go through to some hacking. So yeah, this is a quote from Jurassic Park. Uh, that's B.D. Wong. Um, he's also in Law and Order SVU, I think, SUV. <laughs> but yeah, he, uh, he had a quote. He looks real young here as well. He had a quote about, um, I think in Jurassic Park, they replaced the dinosaur genes with, I watched it on the plane here, by the way. They, they put the dinosaur genes with frog genes and so that they would all be the same. <clears throat> um, they, they couldn't interbreed, right? And then Ian Malcolm comes in and goes, you know, life finds a way. He goes, life uh, finds a way. And of course, they did. They started replicating, self-replicating. And what I'm trying to get at, sorry, what I'm trying to get out there is that hackers will find a way in, no matter what. You can throw all sorts of barriers, and they will literally just find a way in. And that's, you know, it took a long time, but I found my way in. Now, what happens when you send a factory device, or you send a device out of the factory, right? Leaves the factory floor, you think it's all sweet, like this was this left the factory floor, I assume Mexico or something like that, or local. Um, I'll get uh, corrected on that after this, but anyway. Yeah, so you can find the documents on the FCC filing. So the FCC filings, if you're not aware, is the uh, something about radio commission. Um, and they actually have a working group currently about agricultural cybersecurity, and it's called the Precision Ag Working Group. And they have by month, every couple of months they have a YouTube video about it, it goes for six hours. I sat through one of them and I'll never sit through another one again because they go for six hours. But the FCC actually dishes out internal photos of all the products. So you can actually go on there and find the internal photos of this John Deere display without having to buy one. And then you can also 
You can also figure out what devices you need to hack that before you even buy the device, or if you can even hack it, if you know what I mean. So software hints as well. So a lot of OEMs, they, you know, they deliver firmware updates over the web and things like that. And you can actually obviously download those because those, you don't need the device to download that, that update. And you can actually you know, disassemble and decompile those updates. We've got style, comments, and vocabulary. So in those devices, you'll find code that has weird styles or, or interesting comments, in fact, some code has a lot of comments, uh, and you can usually tell what you know if they're a native speaker of English, or if they you know if they write comments in Russian or, or Chinese, for example, they're obviously from that location, or the developers are, and the vocabulary and things like that. And you can pick these things up and figure out, without even knowing the code, about what this sort of device is you know is going to expect. And for example, in John Deere's case, and a couple of the other OEMs, they have a lot of comments in the code, and you can actually read. It's almost like following along. It helps you actually debug it, if that's a proper word to use. And coding competency, that's probably, um, I'm not blaming anyone for this, but I'm saying like things, for example, stuff that's maybe 10 years old, the, the coding maybe ethics or, or, what's the word, not ethics, it's like the competency or the style is a little bit different to what it would be now, for example. Um, FCC's got a perfect site. I've got in there Trimble in the search bar. You can actually search Trimble and get all the Trimble products. And I'm, I'm not just picking on John Deere today, so Trimble's there. I've got 10 different shell companies, sorry, companies around the world. Uh, and then you can obviously find the FCC IDs, for example, like this. This is the GFX 750. And you can find the FCC ID just by Googling it, obviously. And then, yeah, there's internal photos. So SGS, I think, is a contract a contract. Uh, they come up a lot. You'll see a lot of them. They do contract uh, reports, I believe for signals or stuff. So yeah, if OEMs are here, be careful what you put in those FCC filings because hackers and threat actors and people from places that you don't want to hack into those devices are able to see that. And, you know, they can, so just be wary. Some, some manufacturers tend to scratch off the chip. Uh, it doesn't work usually because you can just guess or figure out what it is from the OEM. Sorry, from the, some, some, some products have the list or the bill of materials and you can get those uh, IDs and item IDs, etc. Um, so yeah, this is what we use to disassemble or decompile the code that's in the wild. So with the John Deere display, I was able to take off a lot of the code and then put it through some tools. So IDA, an industry standard, Ghidra, also an industry standard, and there's also other decompilers like or, de de um, or de disassemblers and decompilers, for example, Binary Ninja and things like that. I'm not a big fan, even though I have a copy of it uh, down. Yeah, so this is what... If you're not familiar with IDA, real quick, it turns that into that, which is you know assembly or pseudocode, and then that goes into uh, this, which is practically code. So it will turn what you've sent out the factory back into that. Uh, obviously, that's you know you can't really defend against a lot of that stuff. You can with obfuscation, but uh, that becomes complex for the customer to actually use the product. Obviously, so <clears throat> another example is Ghidra. Ghidra is free. And it's also created by the NSA, so you know it's powerful. Uh, it's used by a lot of people, and you can collaborate on projects. And it's open source. Uh, so the NSA actually released the source code, and you can actually take it and run with it. And if you can't read it, it's miniature text, size 2 font. But that says Ag Leader. That's me mucking around with some Ag Leader stuff. Um, yeah, there's just some other libraries in there. So it's extremely powerful. So you can actually drag in everything from an entire disk into Ghidra, and it will just suck it all up, right? And when you double click or open up a, any other programs, it will cross-reference the other stuff in the, in the stuff that you've dragged in and actually bring those objects into your code so that you can actually debug it or, or disassemble it properly. There's some popular um, John Deere stuff that I won't go into too much, but you don't actually have to be able to read code or even understand certain code to actually go through this. Because you can see there, it's in plain, plain text. So can diagnostic manager service mock limit diagnostics value. Well, I, can, I can sort of assume what that means, just from what, what it says there. Um, and if you go through, you don't even need to be able to read code, but you can just sort of sort of get the gist of it. Yeah, get the gist of it. So it's so a command line executor. It's impossible to read, but it's just command line executor. It's all in plain English. Um, and you get the gist of it. 
So that's one there. It's about command timeout, allotted time is blah, blah, blah. And that's just an example of the code that comes out of Ghidra. Just checking the time. Heaps of time. Um, <clears throat> I could go into a lot more of the John Deere stuff, but I won't do that today because some of it's pretty critical to infrastructure and I don't really want to... Um, yeah, it's just something, to, something to, for someone else to look at down the track. So Trimble, for example, has an FTP server that you can go and download all of the Trimble software. So if you want to get some vulnerabilities in Trimble stuff, you can just go to the FTP server. It's, it's, it's deliberately um, public, but you can download all the stuff. You've got you know, Windows 7 boot, which probably is 15 years old. Um, you know, just heaps of old stuff, like .rename, that's a great file name. And reminding you again that manu like that stuff's been on that stuff's been online for ten years, some of that stuff. And I want to remind you again is manufacturers need to get lucky every day. But consider the tools that I was talking about earlier, which is relatively new, because I think the, the NSA released it to the public in what, twenty twelve or something. You know, cross reference that, Windows seven is well and truly prior to twenty twelve. But yeah, we just need to get lucky once. So can anyone do extreme software reverse engineering of very sophisticated, very big, you know, crazy sized systems? The answer is yes. You can just go and rent massive servers. If you haven't got enough RAM at home, you can just go and rent servers. And don't worry about the price there. If you look at the hourly price, that's like $7 an hour. And you can get like, what, seven, eight terabytes of NVMe RAM and 96 threads, you know, 500 gigabytes of memory. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, two, there's another one. This is a huge one. Two, two terabytes of RAM, 25 gigabit, $8 an hour, which is ridiculously cheap. And if you don't believe me how actual powerful these are, uh, these NVIDIA A100s, they're actually banned last month. The US banned sales of them to China, so, so the A100 down there. So they're pretty, uh, pretty important. That's the NVIDIA A100. It's a massive chip for AI. But you can rent them for 20 bucks an hour, you know, eight of them. So I just ended up doing that myself and brought my own one at home. I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not from um, China or anything, but I just thought I'd bring it home with me instead so I can, you know, maximise my usage. That's me flexing off my PC. But you don't need a strong PC to do it. Um, that's just, yeah, I went overkill. But yeah, back onto hardware. So um, the next bunch of slides is, is, is a very modified version of the DEF CON talk because I actually had the wrong set of slides on stage. But yeah, the, the machine can control the display, the display controls the MTG, and vice versa, all the way around. So you can actually update yeah, the, 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 the BCM, or the, or the or I don't know what it's called in a tractor, because I, I don't drive tractors. But you can actually update the d display from the gateway, and vice versa, USB sticks, all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. And obviously, that's for convenience. But obviously, there's risks involved with that, right? Because you can imagine things going wrong. You know, if one of the parts is vulnerable, then all of the parts are vulnerable, right? Uh, another risk there is OEM over the air updates, you know, like Wi Fi updates or, um, or uh, I think Wi Fi updates. I, think, I don't know if you guys do um, radio updates. Pretty sure there's some sort of ability to do that or activations. Uh, unsigned updates is, a, is, an, is something to think about, you know, being able to flash firmware with unsigned firmware. That's obviously a risk. And, um, the, the elephant in the room, which would be malicious updates. So, you know, someone coming in in the middle of the night, it's a very weird situation, but someone coming in and putting in a dirty USB or whatever, putting in some weird malicious update, you know, they're not going to get too much information off one end tractor, but if they had all of the tractors, obviously you get a substantial amount of data. <clears throat> probably the most dangerous part that I personally believe in the displays is probably the remote desktop protocol. So you can actually remote from the cloud on the Johnny Cloud, on your phone as well, remote into your tractor. And you can imagine being able to remotely control a tractor, how things can obviously go quite wrong, quite fast. Uh, yeah, so on t in terms of displays, I've got one of those ones that have, that's gone wrong. <laughs> I made it go wrong myself. I destroyed it um, multiple times, recovered it. And that's me changing the root password on my device. I've got a terminal on mine. That doesn't come out of the factory like that. And that terminal allows me, you know, if you've got Mac or anything like that, or Xterm or what's it called, Putty, like I've got my own little terminal and I could just change files, run any command I want, fully uh, rooted. The other word's jailbroken, but um, yeah, it depends which way you, way you say it. Um, but not just John Deere is vulnerable to things in their attacks like this. For example, uh, I'll show you one shortly in Topcon. And Trimble, for example, does Android. 
Um, and you can imagine, you know, things that go wrong in Android, you hear about all the Samsung hacks, and you can imagine OEMs in agriculture, they get looked at far less often. So that's GTA San Andreas running on a Topcon. Um, and I'll show you how slow it is. Where's that? Uh, might have a bit of sound here. I might have to mute it. So, so you can check the FPS on that. So it's certainly not playable. It's like, oh shit, here we go again. You know that? So I didn't know I could swear, sorry. Yeah, it's obviously not working, but that was just a random, um, you know, vulnerability or whatever, but I think it was just, it's not my video, um, but uh, yeah, I got sent that one by a lot of people that reached out. A lot of people reached out after I did the John Deere jailbreak. A lot of people reached out. One guy reached out and asked me if I could change the odometer on his BMW. I said, no, what the fuck, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Because that's illegal, isn't it? <laughs> and I don't break the law. <laughs> So yeah, trivial, trivial changing of the OS. Um, you can put San Andreas on there on a flashcard, put it back in the display, and then you know Bob's your uncle. But it's not that exciting, right? You know, it's not that exciting playing something off a. It's like you know using some old screen. So probably the most uh, future equip, probably most future equipment's going to be using Android. Um, and you know, I've asked some OEMs and they can't confirm nor deny. But Trimble's already switched switched to Android. Um, Android being, you know, the easiest to work with, easiest to modify, things like that. For example, Fiat, Chrysler, Stellantis, you know, that's Ferrari, Dodge, Ram, Maserati, for example. <coughs> They've all gone um, to Android. Trimble, yeah, Trim, Trimble as well. Uh, they've also gone to Android. Most OEMs of, yeah. Hang on, so we got a bit of feedback. Is that, is that all right? Cool. Yeah, so you've got to be careful when you're moving to Android. For example, ADB, you know, the Android debugging bridge, uh, that's obviously shouldn't be in the production environment. And custom vendor code is where the big problems happen. And I'll give you an example of where I actually violated one of these things. And if you don't know, but TCL TVs. So they had a big hullabaloo in 2020, where that's me, sick codes on the bottom, discovered a massive quote unquote backdoor in the TV, in the, in the TVs. So much so that Director of uh, Chad Wolf, I think it was Department of Homeland Security acting director at the time, acting secretary, actually referenced the vulnerability. And um, well, that was the vulnerability there. You could just browse the entire OS, which is ridiculous. But yeah, so acting secretary at the time said, uh, quote, you know, DHS is reviewing Chinese manufacturers such as TCL. So they incorporated backdoors into the TVs. Um, yeah. So basically, the TV was spying on you. And um, they didn't get off very lightly. Another thing you can do is put Minecraft and stuff on your tractor, on the Android ones, for example, and put Farming Simulator, which would be full circle, because you're you know, using Farming Simulator on a farming device. So yeah. And obviously, Doom. It's not that exciting when it comes from the App Store. But yeah, I think, that's, I, think I already did hardware. But um, so I hacked deer equipment because it was exciting and stimulating to me. That's the only reason I hacked it. Um, all of these devices, I've got the one on the far right. Well, it's the, it's the lower version of the far right. And the other three, uh, you'll see, I think they've all been rooted. The second last one is the most common one out there at the moment, the 2630. And you probably know someone with one. Uh, I've never seen one because I don't have them. But I do have a 4240. So the brown box. That's the oldest device in circulation from the 2000s, early 2000s. Farmers still use it. Uh, super old, but super, you know, still usable, still usable. So you can see in the top right, 2002, it's in scribbly text. <clears throat> Lifetime unlocks. Um, we won't get into that today, but yeah, unlocking software on there is, you know, it's lifetime unlocks. You can use it forever. The 1800. This is a rare device. Uh, I was told today that it was actually after the 2600, but we'll talk about that in a sec. But this device is uh, less common, and it's also, you know, sells for about 800 bucks. Well, that's at the start of the auction, but that's also been edited or rooted, I guess. But that's the Windows CE desktop. That's not supposed to be like that. Um, the 2600, that's another John Deere display. It's this, probably the third most common, I believe. 
and that runs VxWorks, which is a modified version of Linux, or vo modified version of Linux, pretty much. Um, and some of the problems with this one is, uh, for example, we're getting debug symbols in production, and things like that. We've got WDB, ComDev, init, which is probably, I think on the next slide I've got it. Yeah, probably wind river debug likely. So that probably shouldn't be in production. You know, it says policy deployed, so I assume that's deployed out in the field. And I'm, and I'm not reading code here, I'm just reading the, whatever it says on, this, on the, um, on the uh, output of the display. And yeah, debug symbols in production. So the, the advantage of debug symbols in production means you can actually take that, put it in Ghidra, and it will just split out plain, plain code for you, plain text. And they're, um, yeah, they're five, six grand. I think the last one was sold, I saw on Big Iron, Big Iron Auctions. And then they've got the 2630, the workhorse of the industry. This is the most popular device out there, by far, from what I know. And I, I'm, you know, I don't know John Deere's stats, but I'm just guessing. Uh, you can do all sorts of cool different functionality, you know, U USB data, uh, mobile data transfer, you know, remote desktop access, things like that, cool stuff. It's also running Windows CE. Um, it's $8,000 second hand. Of course it's second hand because it's like 15 years old or something. But the end of life as well, it's kind of an issue. And something that needs to kind of be discussed, but it's kind of awkward because you can't really just go out there and turn them all off. But yeah, they went end of life at the start of this year. So they've what, been, in, been in service for 16 years? Is that right? Yeah. So yeah, the problem with that, the paradox is they're required to keep the food supply chain running, but they're end of life. So what do you do about that? Do you just live, you know, you get, you get, you get no support from the OEM, they're not sending out updates because it's literally, it's dead. You know, how, how, do you, how do you balance this? Do you just accept the risk and, and just run with it? And I think you kind of have to at some stage, you know, you can't just remove a product from, um, you can't recall something that's 16 years old. Um, but what can the user do? You know, what can the actual farmer or, or you know, anyone who has that device do with it? You know, do they upgrade the device, go to the manufacturer such as John Deere, such as Deere, and actually get the new version, or do they, you know, do they run the vulnerable version? At some point, you've got to just accept the risk, you know, and it's okay to run vulnerable software as long as it's, you know, as long as you know that risk is there. It's like, you know, you know there's a CVE out there and you haven't updated it yet, you're technically doing the same thing. But it depends, you know, what's your attack scenario, your threat scenario, are you okay with that, things like that. And uh, another one there is, is there any known vulnerabilities in the software, you know, versus zero days? Or does the end user just jailbreak it and take over and fix it themselves? And here's an example of that happening. So this was the, so the, I think the federal government, not 100% not sure who did it, I think it was like something, someone that controls the skies. Um, they rescinded the ITC connection in some way or form. I tried to get the PDF, but it's actually removed from the, um, I think it was NASA or whatever it was, it's removed from that page. But yeah, it was uh, removed and all of those devices were bricked, so you couldn't actually use them anymore, the Starfire ITC. So obviously what did people do? They created projects that you can actually use it again. <laughs> so this is a project on GitHub called WAS Steer, so it uses WAS signal, which was the one that I told you was getting removed, um, and you can whack it on one of these teensy boards with, you know, triple CAN bus header, and uh, actually trick the device into thinking it's using the new version, but still using the old signal, I believe. So yeah, um, if you have a look at this code, it, there's only like one, two, three, four, there's only like six actual lines of code, the rest of it's comments, so you don't even need to be able to read code to understand what's going on here, and you probably can't read it too because it's probably minuscule, um, but I'll read it out. The most significant nibble, nibble is not a coding word, but it's just whatever, indicates the signal type the GPS has. So this is just, someone's just written this really cool code and debugged the John Deere signal and said, if the signal type is 046, I don't know what that number that is, that's, you know, if it's that, tell it it's SF1. And that's how it literally just tricks it into thinking it's someone else. And then it's back to, back to new, you can use it again. Wow. This is open source too. Uh, one byte to undeprecate that entire device. Because I think the actual deprecation date for the signal is 2025, I think. There were reasons to do it. I'm pretty sure it's security-related re reasons. 
because uh, it's you know it's an older signal and you want to get everyone on the new I guess encrypted signals but um, but that brings up the thing about farmers do they prefer to use old equipment for the reliability productivity it's proven familiar less device restrictions something that you, you know you trust you know, you've used for five ten years you know why would you want something that's going to bring problems and, and issues into your life um, and this is one of the ones that I well, I, I've never had a tractor before, but this is the one that I bought off eBay, and I have destroyed it. Like you can see, it's, it's, its guts are over there. Uh, it's got an RS-232 cable attached to it, and then elongated for some reason, because it was probably too short, because it was too far away from the computer. Um, this isn't the one I bought. Mine was from Italy. Uh, but this, yeah, they're the five grand. They're a bit cheaper than the eight grand ones, right? Um, they're a bit cheaper, because uh, they're actually, you know, the Farmers, some farmers prefer that the, the older one because it's more reliable in some cases. Um, but the reason I chose this one to hack and put uh, Doom on it was because this is the one that's going to be next generation's hand me downs, I guess, or not, it's probably the word for it, it's the fleet market. And this is what I've assumed and actually confirmed, I guess, through my summons <laughs> is that the second hand market is going to eat these ones because the 2630. You know, they're, they're getting traded a lot on the second-hand market. Like I said, unique model of adoption. And, you know, people here will, some people here will know that it's very, uh, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a word for it. But um, I know in Australia, it's very, very, like, yeah, there's a, there's a word for it, but I haven't got it in my brain right now. A little bit jet-lagged. Um, and equipment in ag lasts forever which I'm sure uh, some of you may have realised. You know, I've, I've just landed here for the first time ever in Iowa and, you know, I've seen all these tractors getting dragged around on, on, on vehicles. It's new for me. I'm sorry. It's new for me. Um, yeah, there's some signals there that are general, you know, tons of different signals that you'll find in the, in the devices. So they're not just, you know, USB and Wi-Fi. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in there that can be exploited as well if, if uh, you've got the right exploit. For example, this device here, I was able to come in over RS-232 because I've got a cable, which I don't have here because I don't need it because I don't have the computer attached, but um, I use that to change the password on it. And before I changed the password, I had to edit the OS. But yeah, I was able to get in there and, and wreck it. So they're made by Win. So the OS is actually controlled or, or sold by Wind River Linux. I believe it used to be an Intel company, but now it's not. But Intel is one of their customers now, which doesn't really. It's kind of confusing. Uh, they Wind River is in a lot of different things, you know, like the Boeing 787, the 777, but also, um, you know, Stinger missiles, Patriot missiles, Tomahawk missiles. You know, the F-16, F-18, 35, blah, blah, blah. It's in, like, literally everything defense-related. So it's a pretty important OS, if you know. If, um, if uh, yeah, A380. <laughs> um, it's also in the John Deere 4240. Uh, it's also open source. You can actually go and download that OS from the Wind River website. You have to fill out a form because there's a little bit of that, I don't know what it's called, but it's the thing where you can't sell arms or whatever overseas. And given that it's the Linux in arms, <laughs> it's a little bit sus. But yeah, you can actually, if you can't get that, you can sign up to John Deere's website uh, and go to the display simulator. You have to sign up now. Previously, before some of the stuff that I'd done research on, you didn't have to sign up. <laughs> but that, that's a little bit different now. <clears throat> and that's my one there. So there's nothing, <laughs> that's someone else's field. It's actually the guy in Italy that I bought it from. But his field's actually in Italy, uh, and this is just nothing there, so. But yeah, I own it. That's mine. No one can take it away from me. Uh, I'll do it without this demo mode. Comes with these demo modes, um, and uh, yeah. So that's the that's the PCB there. It's covered all in this epoxy resins, you know, little fire retardant uh, stuff there. And also in the bottom right, you probably can't see it. There's a little black square. And oh, I'll just go through the connectors. We've got HS Auto Link too. It's a proprietary connector that 12 pin connector, you'll start seeing it in a lot of products. It's really annoying because the pins are really small. Uh, but yeah, that's the flash at the bottom. Where's it going? Bottom right is the flash. And I actually took that thing off about 20 times um, and almost destroyed it too. You'll see it coming off in a bit. Um, this is the pin out of that 26 pin connector, I think it is. How many pins is that? 20, yeah, 26. So this pin out here, 
you know, there's not many pins connected. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, or whatever. You only need to put those on, and that's what I've actually done here. I've just hooked up those two wires on the back there, and it's just connected, bang, onto a power supply. And it's just char it's not in a tractor anymore. It's on, my, it's on a it's on a chair, and with a 12 volt power supply attached to it. Uh, that's what it looks like. Just bang, it's on. And there's also two pins there, 20 and 21. These pins weren't actually documented. Uh, maybe they're in a future, uh, in a later version of this, but those two pins are actually RS-232 transmit and receive. And actually shows you the login prompt of the device, which is obviously very, very useful. Those two pins there, blue and yellow being, I think it's two and three on the RS-232. Uh, oh, the pinouts there, fantastic. I think this is a proprietary document, but um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure about that one. The, those two pins connect up to the relevant pins on the board. And that, that's a generic pinout of RS-232, by the way, as far as I know. Uh, that's what happens when you screw it up and you reboot the device over 10 times in a row. You get recovery mode. And that's like when you get blue screen of death on a, uh, on a Windows device when you... Well, it doesn't happen anymore, but you get that weird, weird screen. So. Um, that's me just modifying some of the boot stuff there because I wanted to figure out if I could reverse that issue. Because as you can see there, it says you you must contact the dealer to recover data and software reinstallation. So I thought, well, I'm in Thailand. I was in Thailand. I'm like, how, am I, how the heck am I going <laughs> to fix this? So I took off this disk, sorry, the, the flash, and uh, put into a, a, a popular uh, uh, hacker socket. These weren't around. <laughs> even four or five years ago. Well, maybe there was a really expensive version of it. But I got one of these, what, 200 bucks? And I was able to dump the firmware directly off the John Deere uh, straight into a disk image on my computer. These, these weren't around when the OEMs produced the device. You know, and then maybe they weren't expecting them. Um, and maybe, they, you know, it's just, it's hard to obviously expect the unexpected, but yeah, these devices are pretty good at reverse engineering firmware. And actually, if you go to like AliExpress or whatnot, you can find all sorts of different contraptions that people have come up with. Um, and actually, there's a whole bunch of the similar devices there. There's one, there's one with the SD card attached to it, so you don't even need that big bulky thing on. And then there's one down there with all the, all the different sets of different types. And then there's a carbon copy. Someone just ripped off that brand <laughs> straight on the bottom. So when you bring that into a, uh, into a Linux computer, you can start seeing the file system, raw file system, raw file system. And if you put that onto an actual disk, you can probably run that straight off a PC. In fact, you can probably run it off a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, so once, once you get that thing off, you've got to obviously put it back on, and it is a mission, and I don't recommend doing it uh, without testing it on some other devices first because it is a pain in the X. Because these little balls are one millimeter or half a millimeter in size. Like that's, that's obviously not to scale. <laughs> yeah, and it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. And I think I took it off like 20 or 30 times. And yeah, that's when it looks like when you do a good one. You know, really nice, really um, ready to go straight back on the board. So how do you get around this recovery image stuff? Like, how am I going to get around this? I want to, I want to start using the device again. So I decided, uh, this says here, your system's in a recovery mode. Please contact your local John Deere dealer. Uh, and I'm not a dealer. But uh, dealers, please refer to the latest machine manual. It says, the problem is I'm in Thailand, uh, and there's no dealers in Thailand. There was actually one in Bangkok, but I think it was, yeah, it was a 14-hour drive or 1,100 kilometers away. I, like, I know in Iowa, there's a few dealers in Iowa, but uh, in Thailand, they're, they're not so common. And yeah, and I thought I'd become the dealer, so let's see, look at me, I'm the dealer now. So yeah, download the official John Deere software package manager. Um, hopefully it's still like this. It says your tool's out of date, and I think it's talking about the software. Um, and yeah, it downloads a whole bunch of gigabytes of software for you, 12 gigabytes of John Deere software that you can just have a look at. And like I said before, hackers only need to get lucky one time. You know, 12 gigabytes of software, that's a lot of software. I think the disk is only, what, 16 gigs? 
downloads a whole bunch of different architectures. Now, that's natural for companies to have this many architectures. But it's also good to contrast and compare. So if you download the ARM v7 or the third one, the fourth one, ARM v7 v2, which I'm pretty sure they're pretty similar, because I was able to use stuff from the first one, from I actually use Fedora Linux to jailbreak it. Um, but yeah, the second one, Intel Atom, or whatever Atom is, I assume it's that, Core i7, you know, you can sort of compare and contrast and figure out what the differences are between these, and you can actually get clues out of that. And, you know, I think hacking is a little, little bit of Blue's Clues crossed with um, just absolute mayhem and then just time, I think, time, just, just, yeah, just spending, I think I spent a year on this, and obviously I could do it now in 20 minutes, and, you know, I'm kind of showing everyone how to do it, uh, and it wouldn't take that long now, but, like I said, it's just sort of this Spitfire approach of failing and screwing stuff up frequently, very frequently. So I thought, okay, I had a copy of the code because I showed you that thing before I dumped the firmware off it. I've got a full copy of John Deere's source code now. Well, some of it's compiled, some of it's not compiled. But some of the uncompiled stuff says here, reprogramming image check file. There's some really cool flag that I can put on the USB to allegedly be able to reprogram it. And there's the same one there. I think it's just the same. Is that the same? No, it's different. It's referring to the same file, the JD bootable USB flag. So well, let's put that in the disk folder. Uh, that's, the, that's what happens when you download the device. That's my serial number, by the way. Um, it's not really relevant, but, but uh, if I connect to the internet, they'll know exactly where I am. And we don't do that. <laughs> and um, yeah, so the bottom one there, the JD bootable flag, Sorry about the font, pink on black, that's what I use on my computer. But uh, the second one, third one, there's dealer auth. Fourth one's 4343402. I don't know, I saw that in a file, and then, like I said before, it's just sort of hit and miss. You just keep throwing stuff at it until something works. And in this case, I threw three things at it at once. And we got system recovery version 1, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1 1.3.1. And then it was going around in circles, doing all three of those updates at the same time. But I didn't realize that was actually, they were, they were in competition. They were trying to update, and they were like, no, killing everything else and going, I'm updating. And it kept looping. So I got rid of two of them, and then just put the first one there, and that was all sweet. And I was able to fix my device. So I no longer had to attend the dealership that doesn't exist for me in Thailand, in a remote tropical island. <laughs> Yeah, very far from here. Uh, but yeah, that's working now, it's working. And that was it, that was, the, that was the first bypass, was just literally put a file in the USB drive called dealerauth.txt. How good's that? Uh, yeah, yeet, that's me just fixing it up, getting it back to normal now. Um, and that's reflashing it. So it's using the software that it downloaded from the official John Deere site with that little text file, that single text file, and then fixing it up. You don't even need the dealer now for this <laughs> issue. Uh, and it, yeah, it worked. So it worked. And yeah, that worked. I'm the dealer now. So I got back to the Eula. Um, I've got my own, own Eula. I, look, I keep joking about that. So yeah, if you decline, it just reboots. So yeah, but I skipped it. Um, yeah, so it sends back logs. Uh, like. I think it was 12, 1.6 gigabytes of logs back on the disk. So when you update it over USB, you get 1.6 gigs back of, like that's a lot of logs. What could possibly be in those logs? In fact, it was every log that was on the device. And you can imagine what kind of information you can get out of that. You know, you've got yum, you can't read it, but it says yum log, and that's the package manager for Red Hat based, or RHEL based, or, Red, or RPM based distros. We've got, you know, syslog number 17, which obviously goes back to 16, 14, 12, blah, 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 all the way to null or zero, you know, D message number four, there's just bucket loads of logs of like literally the entire lifetime of the device. And uh, that's obviously uh, ad advantageous. Does that mean low battery or something? Uh, yeah. So I got 1.6 gigs of logs. Um, and out of those logs were some of these things. This is actually what happens when you plug it in over the RS-232, you get this terminal. Uh, if you tap, 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 enter, it just comes, you know, log in, you've got to type in your username and password. And I obviously don't know the password. Let's grab some water. Where's it gone? So yeah, this is the FS tab. And on Linux, there's a FS tab which tells you whether or not a disk will be readable or writable when you boot it. And in this case, all of them are read only except for the opt persistent and opt user data. 
but you can actually change that. Um, and it's important to be able to change that too because you want to figure out, you want to be able to modify things like add your own software like I did. I put Doom on it. <laughs> you, you want to be able to change the password, but you need to, you need to edit, you need to put it into read-write mode first. So took off this disk again. It was just, it was mayhem. It might even be as mayhem as, as the way I'm trying to explain it, but it was absolute, you know, like, I can't explain how many times I took it off. But it's also damaging every time you do it as well. And I think uh, one of the ones I got here, one of the clues that I got to fix that read-only mode was you just have to do mount-o, remount, read-write with the forward slash, which is just the root file. System. You just have to mount it again, and then it's read-write. It's pretty easy. You can't do that unless you have a terminal, but I have a terminal because I rooted mine. And this was me attempting to read the data off the back of the board without having to take off that chip that I mentioned. It didn't work. <laughs> and actually, those two wires on the right are actually back to front. But they should be on the top chip. But since DEF CON, uh, if you were at DEF CON, there's got, the guys from the Exploiteers group were giving out these chips. Well, they're SD cards with the five things at the back here. We've got, what, command, reset, positive, negative, clock, and probably data zero or data one, whatever. And Oh, there's actually the second one's got the list. It's minuscule text. But yeah, with those connections, you can actually read and write to the chip that I just took off 20 times without having to take it off. Uh, I thought, OK, let's. I got to that boot error again multiple times, that, that system recovery thing. And I thought, OK, let's try and you know, change it to 9999 and things like that. Um, and I actually got a command called reboot clear boot count, which was good, because now I think I could get rid of that or prevent that screen from happening. I'm pretty sure I did too. And this is what happens when you, yeah, when you don't solder that back on properly, you get this. And uh, I think I saw this like maybe 200 times. I think it's the only photo I got of it because I saw it so much that I got sick of seeing it. And um, it's also important to get backups, backup disks. And those disks, are, those disks are end of life. So the only place you can get them is off second-hand boards, off AliExpress, where they literally get a saw and just chop these chips off the boards. And you can find most chips <laughs> are available in that format. It's actually quite funny when you get them as well. Um, some of them come with other people's data as well, which is hilarious. You know, like other people's random like, iPhone or whatever from a di distant country. Um, that's a soldering, that's a, sorry, <laughs> it's, a, it's a hot, hot plate, a soldering hot plate made out of a iron. And like I said, Jurassic Park, you know, the hackers will find a way to get stuff done. So the other, the other way you're supposed to do that was a reflow oven. But yeah, it's, uh, it's actually a popular method. That's what happens when you don't do stuff properly with this device. You know, there's like, I can't imagine the amount of times I busted it. Um, but when I rooted it, I added this little cron job to pop up a terminal every two minutes in the uh, cron tab. And that's, this is the moment when I first got the terminal pop up. And I was, I couldn't, I, like, I was like shaking. I'm like, oh my, it worked, it worked. Um, and I knew it was over by then. So, couple of things that we needed to get Doom running was getting some cool commands. So John Deere put a ton of cool binaries in there that we can use that weren't in the original path. So if you're on Linux and you press tab, 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 you can, you know, you'll, you'll get all the commands you can type out. But if you add additional paths, um, such as these ones, which John Deere actually added, there's, there's a extra stuff that you can run. And for example, one of those commands was chroot, which lets you, you know, pretend you're in a subsystem on Linux. And that was one of the keys to jailbreaking this device, is that uh, because they've got a version of lib SDL, libc, blah, all these different libs, lib libs, uh, glib as well, they're all in, not in the right order that I wanted it to be for the version of Doom that I was using. I thought, OK, stuff it. I'll just chop it all in a, in, a, in a disk folder and run a Fedora Linux through chroot. And that's the way to do it, apparently. I didn't know that at the time, but it's either LD preloading or chrooting. Uh, didn't need to do any of these things. Uh, but what I wanted to do after this was actually change the root password, because then I could do it over 
I didn't have to do it over the touchscreen anymore. I could do it over the RS-232 cable. And I wanted to enable SSH. I never did enable SSH. Uh, and read-write, we didn't have to do that because uh, that was already done with that mount-o remount command. And the terminal was popping up through the cron job. I think we're in the home stretch here, but yeah. A couple of cool different things that I found in there was, um, yeah, you could just edit the pin numbers for the, for the I think it's anti-theft, I'm not sure, but I assume it is. The administrator, the operator, it's in plain text. You just modify those files. It's not that exciting, but it is if you have a stolen device. That little chip there, which that's where the black chip was for before, but well, they're all, they're, all the chips are black on the, on the PCB. The, that square there with the eight legs, that's the EEPROM. It contains the serial number, the serial number of the device. Uh, I thought, well, okay, we'll take that off and have a look at it. So we got it off, looked at the data sheet. It's pretty arbitrary. You know, I don't understand half the stuff that's on this screen at the time. And I thought, I'll just put up some hack job together. And I just, you know, connected the green wire. This is all hardware hacking is. It's just green wire goes to green and then red goes around the back. And then it's literally all you have to do. And that is actually an ESP board that I've just repurposed because it has really nice linings. All those numbers and whatever's down the bottom, sorry, the screen printed uh, labels, all of them are incorrect because it's from a different board. That's the correct output. That one there, that's obviously a non-standard way of writing it, which is really annoying as well. But thankfully, just random GitHub user Timos found a, made an awesome project that you can just read write using Arduinos. So I plugged into Arduino, hooked up the wires, and bang, I was reading all this data. And this is a really manual way of doing it. There's way better ways of doing it. You can actually get the sockets that I showed you earlier, but for the little ones, and just bang, bang, and you're in. And yeah, got some data out of it. Serial numbers down in there, the PA15, whatever it is, that's the serial number. And obviously, that's read-only memory when you've got the device running, but if you take it off the board, you can write to it and edit it. And there's obviously problems associated with that. Uh, finale, I think the root, root terminal was sufficient in my case. Remounting the OS was the way to do it. Uh, didn't need to edit the FS tab. Usually you've got to edit the FS tab, not in this case. Um, editing the boot partition was a disaster. I uh, had to reboot it multiple times because there's all these checksums in there. But one of the checksums failed, and that was the root password check. It just checks if you have a root password, not if you've changed it, which was good. And that was the final result, which is the terminal emulator running in a John Deere 4240 flagship display. Yeah. <laughs> That took so long to actually, I know it sounds like it, it took a long time for me to explain it, but it took a long time to actually do it. So, yeah, so on top of that, just a couple of last things. Um, yeah, the arbitrary stuff on the board, there's tons of little holes and pins and things like that. I learned all this stuff on Google, anyone can. You know, what, what does four pins here mean or there? Uh, and there's actual devices out there that will automatically work it out for you. Things like the JTAGulator. Um, if you can Google that one, JTAGulator by Joe Grand. Uh, I mentioned it in one of my other, one of my other talks. Um, obviously, there's pads over there. That's probably JTAG, but you know, I didn't attack it. And you could probably get in that way. And a lot of OEMs actually disable JTAG, but uh, I might have a crack at it, actually, uh, when I get back to Thailand. Yeah, so in, in t the socket that I showed you as well, there's other versions of that. You can get like these ones here where you can just stick it on the board. All sorts of different tools and trinkets. Um, yeah, and the benefit of actually getting that terminal, so the benefits of that, if you're a hacker, is you can do stuff like can dump. Uh, you can dump the can tables or can addresses or can frames, uh, whichever way you want to spin it. Configure them, send them. You know, this, we're talking sending stuff to the tractor from the from the display. By the way, we're we're talking sending stuff to the machine to operate. You know, drive this way or, or go this speed. You know, having remote access to that, obviously things can go tragically or catastrophically wrong. Um, but you know, that's by design. Some of the stuff there, the remote desktop access is by design. It's me remounting. It's not that exciting, but it was at the time. 
And that was the actual jail rank that I did. It was, I just went into the cron tab and I saw another file there which was log rotate. And we're assuming that just rotates the logs. So I'll just go on the bottom of that. And I just added this part here, which is the star slash two every two minutes. Star, 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 star. Tell root to start a terminal emulator on display zero. And that was it. And then that's what happens here. It comes up with the display. Yeah. So you can come and play it after as well. It's got Doom running on it too. So, And that's it. Uh, yeah, you can follow me on this. Uh, socials and things like that. This is another. Uh, so I've done a couple of talks related to the hack of the John Deere stuff, but I think uh, some of the stuff today, some of the new stuff and sort of reflections of what I've done, some corrections, I guess, as well. Some of the stuff I think I said before was probably wrong. But yeah, thanks. Any any questions? Yeah, if anyone wants to come and play Doom on a John Deere display, just feel free to come up after. I've got to do a little, I've got to get the path set. It takes like two seconds. I put it in a bash script, just bash path.sh and then bash doom2.sh. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to come up. Or does anyone have any questions on, the, on any, anything at all? Nothing. Is that no one? Yeah, no one. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, you can feel free to come up. But yeah, if you want to play Doom, it's, it's, I'll just get it running now. So. Thanks.